Good morning, everybody. Oh, I thought I would make a mistake and greet you. Good afternoon, Jennifer, because I'm used to the greeting uh, New Life Alliance Church Surrey. Good afternoon. It took us a while to get used to that because, like, we've been greeting in Surrey, we've been greeting people like good morning because I'm used to um, attending morning service here. So, uh, before I talking um, doesn't happen frequently so please bear with me if I talk today for two hours is that okay <laughs> okay um, so let's just please stand up and let's start by reading God's word and it's from the book of the episode of Philippians chapter 4 verses 1 to 9 um, you can open your Bibles if not you can also Uh, follow along with me as I read, I, I read it here. So this is how it goes. Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Iodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. yes. And I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent, or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you again for this wonderful morning, Lord God. And um, just open our hearts and minds right now, Lord Jesus, and Help us to be receptive to your word, Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your servant, Paul, Lord God, whom you've used mightily. Be with us, Holy Spirit. To you be the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone can have their seats now. Again, uh, good morning. Yes, uh, first, I would just like to thank and praise God um, for Suri's first anniversary that happened last week and thank you North Van for your continued support and looking forward to more collaborations as we continue to uh, support each other in attaining our goal which was reminded to us last week by Pastor Ben and that is to please God and time really flies and I can't imagine that it's been a year um, since you guys have commissioned us to Surrey, again, from the bottom of my heart and in behalf of New Life Alliance Church Surrey, thank you. And speaking of time, um, here we are, last Sunday of April. Am I right? And four months of the year have just gone. I don't know, I feel it that way. Again, I always repeat that, that's probably part of getting older. I don't know for the younger ones if um, you feel that way, but that's how I feel, like time like really is fast. And um, I don't know if you're aware that we have been going through this epistle to the Philippians for over two months now. And today is the ninth and the second to the last part of the series. So next week will be the last one. So we are almost done, and I hope by now we memorize the key verse for this series, which is Philippians chapter 4, 
verse 4 that says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Now, the word rejoice is, um, the, the theme is repeated eight to nine times in this book, depending on the version. And uh, with only four chapters in a short letter or book, we can definitely say that this is the central theme of this epistle. Now, hence the reason of the title of the series, Joyful Living. Now, rejoice means having joy or feeling joy or joyful. Now, let me just like ask you this. Like, who among you love Disneyland? Disneyland. <laughs> Nobody? Because <laughs> like I do, okay? If uh, whenever I go there, it brings the child out. It brings the child out. Like, uh, like in me. Um, especially when I first went there with my together childhood friends whom I haven't like seen for like 20 years. So my first time going there, Disneyland and with my childhood friends, it was like, it was fun. And looking at my kids, they um, and other children, they run towards the, the lineup as if that could really make a huge difference uh, in terms of the, li the lineup. It could get them there like much faster. I can say it's really, really, really fun See, you can like feel how I like Disneyland, okay? But can I say it's joy? Hmm, I'm not sure. Because joy and fun are not the same. Having a good time and doing something that is fun is not, aut uh, is not automatically, automatically going, to mean, uh, going to mean that you will experience joy. Fun is dependent on something we do, often some, some, something exciting, like skiing in the mountains, or swimming in the beach in Hawaii, or riding the roller coaster over and over until you vomit or puke. Unfortunately, others, they indulge in alcohol, sex, drugs, just to have fun. It thrives in the present. But what happens when it ends? Fun is temporal, temporary. Fun is defined as enjoyment, amusement, or lighthearted pleasure. Now, I think it's worth noting that some synonyms suggested are enjoyment, entertainment, amusement, pleasure, but not joy. Joy is far more than having fun. Now, what's my point here? Brothers and sisters, following Jesus is certainly not always fun. This was manifested in the fact that this person, Paul, who's saying rejoice in the Lord always, was persecuted, beaten, and imprisoned. And in the end, it costed him his life. Is not fun. Isn't it? Real joy, real and lasting joy, comes from the confidence that no matter what happens, we are saved and inseparably connected to God. Now, let me just give you these things like what we can learn from this passage for today. How to be joyful. Now, there's like a situation here that is going on, but how can we be joyful in the midst of conflict or in the midst of problems? So let me just go to my first point here. First point is to be joyful, we should remember that we are joined with Christ or united with Christ. In verses 1 to 5, this is what it says. And there's two people involved here. I want to pronounce this correctly. Eodia, Eodia and Syntyche. These are female members of the church in Philippi who had disagreement. Now, Paul is about to address an issue here. It is very critical when an issue at church is being addressed. Because it 
go two ways. And in this situation, it could make and break the church. This conflict in these two women have already affected or spread throughout the church because we can feel it because even though like Paul was in this situation, he was in prison, this has to be brought up to him because it's a big issue. But we can learn something from the way Paul spoke through the letter. The way he started this section, the episode, to address an issue. Now listen to how he prepared them before addressing it, addressing the problem. First, he reminded them that he loves them. This is very biblical. Because everything that we do, even when we need to rebuke or address an issue, brothers and sisters, it should be founded in love. Amen? 1 Corinthians 16, 14 says, do everything in love. Whatever we do, especially here, do everything in love. The second one, he reminded them about the Lord, about standing fast, standing firm, remaining in the Lord. Now, these two things are good reminders to us all. Because when you hear that you are loved, and when you hear about our Lord Jesus Christ, and if you consider yourself a follower of Christ, it is really hard not to listen and not to follow. The central concept of this episode is rejoicing, having fun. But arguments and conflict, when not resolved, will take away that joy. As it was mentioned probably like a few Sundays ago, this is what we call joy grabbers or something like that. Now, after Paul kind of pressed their minds and hearts by reminding them about the love and the Lord, he now proceeded in calling out Iodia and Syntyche. But Paul did not go far away from his introduction and reverted back to referencing Christ again. He pleaded for them to have the same mindset like Christ, which he has already said in Philippians 2.5. Verse 2 says here, I plead with Iodia and I plead with Syntyche, to be of the same mind in the Lord. In other versions, it says, live in harmony, agree in the Lord. But this one is something interesting. NLT version is what it says, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. Wow. Do you call yourself follower of Christ? Because if you say yes, and if you want joyful living, since you are a Christian, settle your disagreement. Be of peace because you belong to the Lord. Yodia and Syntyche are followers of Jesus. They helped Paul in probably starting the ministry in Philippi. But that did not exempt them from this situation, from these situations like this. Now, this is a proof that tensions in congregations are no modern problem. When this happens, let's remember the focus on, that focus on God is the best remedy when our own concern starts to dominate our agendas over God. This is from his book, When God Whispers Your Name. It says, conflict is inevitable, but combat is optional. At church, we could not, again, we cannot avoid conflict. We came from different churches, different family. We grew up differently. We have different opinions. But it says combat is optional. We don't have to fight. It's option, that's optional. But again, at church, we don't do that. We love each other. 
because we belong to the Lord. And it says in Philippians 2, 5, but that each of them should lay down their right to be right and take up the cross. Brothers and sisters, the last time I preached, I preached about unity. I hope you still remember something from that preaching. And now God has led me again to this, to bring to us the importance of unity. And look at this. He asked the church to help him and these two women to resolve their disagreement. Isn't that wonderful? It is the church, our responsibility as brothers and sisters in Christ to help each other to resolve disagreements and conflicts within the church. And after that, in verse 4, he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Initially, I was like, kind of like a change of topic here. Rejoice and be gentle, he mentioned. But as I kept reading, I noticed that, oh, this is not, might be a change of topic. It does make sense that Paul reminded them about rejoicing in the Lord after addressing a sensitive issue. And since, this is the, and since this is the theme of his letter. And he goes on to say, practice gentleness to everyone for the Lord is near. It does make sense. Because we do things in a gentle manner, even if we need to rebuke, we need to address and resolve conflict. Rejoice. Be gentle. Brothers and sisters, we just have seen or heard a reality that has been, that happened not only in present but also to the first churches conflict and this also shows us how a church should treat disagreement that though disagreements happen the disagreements that happen here only involve two people it affected the whole church it affects the whole body of Christ and there's a Filipino saying, it goes, I'm going to translate it in English, I'll try. Sakit ng kalingkingan, sakit ng buong katawan. And the, probably the literal translation is um, pain in the pinky, pain in the whole body. But I think the, the proper um, translation to that is when one part of the body is hurting, the whole body hurts. And therefore, brothers and sisters, as church, we need to love each other, be concerned of what's going on, pray, and if need be, be the person that brings reconciliation. Amen? Next one. Offer everything to Christ. Is it, is it wrong to be anxious? Coming here, I was anxious. I was actually anxious like preaching here as I'm always. <laughs> but it's normal to be anxious, brothers and sisters. He says here, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So what is wrong? It's wrong to stay being anxious. How do you stay being anxious? Don't pray. How do you get rid of anxiety? You pray. Luke 12, 25 says, Who of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Raise your hand. No one. Nobody. In fact, by worrying, we are just wasting our time and lose the chance to have a joyful living. Now let's not spend our energy by being worried in any situation. In this case, probably conflict. Rather, use that energy to pray always. Pray everything so that your joy may be complete. 
and God's peace will guard your hearts, your mind, and then you will be joyful. And take note of this. Not just ordinary peace, but the peace of Christ. He himself, that peace that removes troubled minds, that peace that surpasses all understanding, that some people who don't know God won't understand. In any situation, we pray. But let me remind you this, okay? Please remember this. It doesn't mean that God will change the situation. Sometimes, but most of the times, He won't. What He will do is that He will change our hearts and our mind, and He will change our perspectives, how we view situations, Instead of viewing things as a glass half full or half empty, we will view it as half full. Now, speaking of perspective, let me just tell you this story. I just got this story, okay, from, I just Googled this, so women or ladies, you're an example. There was an old lady, so again, sorry, ladies, old, uh, who went into an auto parts store. Now she asked, oh, can I have a 710 cap? And the employees look at each other and they were like, what she mean? What's 710 cap? And she says, yeah, you know, the, the right one on the engine, uh, mine got lost somehow and I need one. So, the employees ask, okay, what brand of car is it on? They ask, so, uh, is it a 1970s Datsun 710? Now, for you who are younger, um, I, I, have, I haven't seen this car, but they say that, but I know that Datsun, it's the, it's Nissan, okay, before 1980s when they changed the, it was Datsun before and they changed the name to Nissan. And there was like a car, uh, Datsun, 1973 to 77, the Datsun 710. But she said, no, 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 it's a Buick. Okay, lady, how big is it? She, and then she makes a circle uh, with hand, either hands about like this, and she said, oh, about, about this, this in diameter. So what, is it, what does it do, they ask. Um, she says, oh, I don't know, but it's always been there and I just lost it. So one employee gives her a notepad patiently and ask her if she can draw a picture of it. So the old lady makes a circle about like that size, the same size, and in the center she writes 710. And the employees behind the counter are looking at it upside down as she writes it. And they just like fell, fell down behind the counter because they were laughing so hard. And one employee finally says, ma'am, I think you want an oil cap. She says, 710 cap, oil cap, I don't care. I just need one and I don't see what's so funny about it. By the way, in, in case you haven't figured it out, the word oil upside down looks like 710 or reads, now, brothers and sisters, perspective makes all the difference. Things look differently when we look at them upside down. Look at Paul. We have been doing this series for two months now. And what we have heard are all encouragement from a person who is in jail bound in chains, and on the verge of death. He isn't even worried or anxious about death. This is because God has changed his heart, his mind, and his perspective, his view through prayer. When we pray, we do not change God's mind. Because he's unchanging. But rather, we allow God to work 
in us wherein we will see things through the lens of God. Amen. Paul reminded us in 1 Corinthians 2.16 that we have the mind of Christ. Since we have the Holy Spirit in us, it's just a matter of allowing him to work in us through prayer. Church, our circumstances and feelings should never stop us from rejoicing, praying, and giving thanks. We can even rejoice in the midst of trial and suffering because of the pattern that Jesus Christ has set. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning his shame in Hebrews 12 too. Jesus did this by focusing on the joy that was to come. He showed us that suffering precedes glory. And Jesus' suffering and resurrection have secured a joyous future for all who have been redeemed. In Christ, we can rejoice always. Also remember that it says every circumstance. Pray with thanksgiving. Good or bad, we pray. In time, in bad times, we thank him. Because circumstances doesn't change who he is and how he loves us. He loves us and cares for us. But it's so easy for us to focus on the fundamental necessities of life. I'm not saying that we don't pray for that. But we can also pray for our anxieties, pray to him our worries, pray to him our burdens, pray to him our frustrations, our anger, our needs. And let's not limit God to what we think he can only do through you. First Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your anxieties on him, for he cares for you all. Offer everything to Jesus. Give him everything. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. For he is going to carry all your anxieties. Amen. The last one is think about Christ. And you might be a bit joyful. Think about Christ and his attributes. Paul knows how important what we think. Our thoughts. Because it influences a lot in how we act. Whatever we constantly feed our mind will come out from our actions. And that is why he encouraged the church in Philippi about these things. Surely they will be affected with the issue between Iodia and Syntyche. They cannot deny that it happened. But don't focus on that. Focus on these attributes. Focus on these things. It's what it says finally, brothers and sisters. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Whatever is true, who is the truth? Jesus say, uh, says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So let's think of him. Whatever is noble, not robo, okay? That's my surname, Roble, Robo. Um, my coworker, he, they got confused and not ro noble. So we cannot, let's not look elsewhere. Jesus is the noblest among nobles. Whatever is right, who is the only righteous one? Jesus. Whatever is pure, let's read the Bible. It contains pureness. And this will make or help us, help our hearts to be pure. Whatever is lovely. I know. Man will probably say, okay, my wife is lovely. Amen, Mr. Man? But 
I'm sure that at the time, like, <laughs> but um, okay, but I'm sure that one time, like, I don't know who among you have experienced coming here to church and you've had a fight before coming here to church. I'm sure that you don't look at your wife lovely, okay? Okay, okay. Uh, so, aside from your wife, think about like lovely. And it's just encouraging us to think about lovely and pleasing to God. It says, whatever is admirable, deserving respect, who else other than Jesus who has given his life for us? And finally, excellent and praiseworthy. Church, this is Jesus. Look to him. Think about him. We are encouraged to think about him, his attributes, and his work. Before coming here, what were you thinking? Were you thinking that, oh, I'm going to sit uh, here because I don't want to sit with that person, because I don't like him, because he's like this, I don't like her, because she's like that? People, I hope not. Because if we, we are here to find fault, there's a lot. We are full of flaws. Not that one, okay? Flaw, F-L-A-O. I tried like repeating this because it sounds the same. I don't want to mispronounce it. That's so flaws. A church is a spiritual hospital full of sick people who need the greater healing, Jesus Christ. When we come to church, think about the attributes of Christ. And even though we don't, we don't, we will not see a perfect person, somehow you will find good characters from each and one of us reflecting the image of Christ. Look for that. Don't come here and look for things from people. Find the attributes of Christ within the church and you will see, you will find something. In verse 9, he says, said in Corinthians in 11 1 he said follow me as I follow the example of Christ brothers and sisters this is Paul a discipler showing his disciples how to walk the talk let me just conclude to rejoice is a choice that's what Ryan said to rejoice is a choice, a choice to follow this command. Rejoicing is not just a suggestion. It is a command. And the command is to do it always. Brothers and sisters, this is doable. And I'm just going to give you two reasons. First, joy is a fruit of the Spirit who dwells in everyone who received Jesus Christ as their Lord and personal Savior. Second is we can rejoice always because of the promises, especially the promise of God's salvation. I have only cited two things, but it's more than enough reason to rejoice always, knowing that we have Him in us and we are secured after this life. Our rejoicing should be in what he has done, doing, and will do in the future, no matter what our circumstance or feeling. And as we end, let me just give you this reflection, application, or take home for Filipino, whatever you, something that you can chat on. You chat on this, Take this home. Um, one is, hey, I usually get a text message from you, Chris, so thanks for sharing that. 
spirit that gives me means to share what I have with you. Second, at the end of this year, I believe Christ can use you for a new year, a new decade. as I end this with this text. This is from Habakkuk chapter 3, 17 and 18. Though the fig tree doth not bud, and there is no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no crop, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord and will be joyful in God my Savior. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we just want to thank you again for your servant, Paul, or God, whom you've used, Lord Jesus. I know it wasn't easy, like for him, Lord God, what he has endured, Lord Jesus, and even like he died for the sake of the gospel, Lord. But he kept reminding us, encouraging us, encouraging the church to continue to press on, to be encouraged, and today to rejoice always in spite of whatever the circumstance, and do not be anxious to pray. Thank you for all those things, Lord God, and we pray that as we step out, Lord God, we, we have within our hearts And right now, I just want to take this opportunity. I don't know your, I don't know your journey, spiritual journey. I don't know if you have received Jesus Christ. But today may be the day that Christ is knocking in the, in the door of your heart, asking you that, hey, I have come so that you may have life and have it to the full. I want your joy to be complete. I don't know your journey right now. But Christ is knocking at your door right in the heart, of your, in your heart right now, asking you, my child, I can give that joy. And peace that transcends all understanding. People may not understand why you have peace. That will, be, that will come from Christ. So if you want that peace, you want that joy, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm troubled, I have anxious thoughts, I have sinned against you, I'm not perfect, but right now, Lord God, I offer everything to you. Lord Jesus Christ, and I accept you as my Lord and personal Savior. And from this day forward, Lord God, help me and guide me so that I'm reminded to be joyful, to rejoice always, knowing that I have that assurance that if I die today, I will be with you in paradise. You pray that prayer, the Bible says you are the son of God, and you're assured that same as Yodia, Suzuki, Clement, Paul, your name is written in the book of life, and you will be with us. All the Christians who will receive Jesus Christ in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's all stand up as we respond to our invitation.